thank you all very much. Thank you for that wonderful oration and uh, explication of my work. I almost feel I can set my speech aside and just see, say, see your remarks. Uh, I also thank you. I thank uh, the committee uh, and all those involved in uh, awarding me this wonderful, wonderful uh, prize. Uh, the fact that I've been preceded by so many distinguished people, I mentioned just the two most recent ones, uh, Timothy Snyder of Yale, whose work Bloodlands has been so significant, and even more so, uh, we talk about activists, General Romeo Dallaire, who tried to stop a genocide and failed because the world would not listen, uh, even though he desperately tried to do so. Excellencies, honored guests, students, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Holocaust denial is often treated as a matter of history. History degraded and history distorted, but history nonetheless. In this presentation, I shall argue that while it presents itself as that, as history, it is something else entirely. And I shall also argue in statements at the very end that whereas the study of Holocaust denial uh, is, I think, important from an intellectual historical perspective, very sadly, it has contemporary resonances which I think should disturb, worry, and even frighten us all. But first, my own background and relation to this topic. When I first heard about Holocaust denial, I laughed. I did not take it seriously. In fact, I learned about it from one of the previous recipients of this prize, Yehuda Bauer. Way back in the 1970s, I was at my first teaching position at the University of Washington in Seattle. We were hosting him, and he told me he had just returned from South Africa, and he had encountered Holocaust denial there. He showed me some of their booklets, and I said, Holocaust denial, who would take that seriously? I certainly didn't. Fast forward a number of years, my book Beyond Belief had appeared. Uh, I was in Israel visiting, lecturing in, at a conference at the Hebrew University, and uh, Professor Bauer and his colleague, Professor Yisrael Gutmann, one of the world experts on the Warsaw Ghetto, took me aside and said, Deborah, we have, have coffee with us. We have a research project to propose to you. So I was, of course, flattered and intrigued. Um, and they said, we think you should study Holocaust denial. And I looked at them, and I said, as uh, my Eastern European grandparents might have said, this is ganz sugar. this is totally crazy. Um, I'm a product of, e of mixed marriage, Eastern Europe and Germany, so. Uh, um, you take them seriously? You think I should pay attention to them? And they said, yes, we think there is something there to study. So I thought it would be a momentary digression from my other work. I would look at this for two, three years, uh, work on it, produce a book, and then move on to other things. History determined otherwise. And here I am, many years later, still involved and still studying and still talking about this. One of the reasons, of course, was the trial, but as I began to look at them, even before I even imagined there would be a legal action, I began to take them more seriously for a number of reasons. First of all, they engage in an assault on history and memory. And there are many people here, academics of different types, who deal, and I've met many of you over the course of today and previous visits, who deal in issues of memory. And we all know how easy it is for memory to be distorted, and not just distorted, but utilized in ways to facilitate other uh, political uh, objectives. Secondly, they have the means to work their way into the broader public's understanding of events. They have the way, as I was telling some of Professor Adler's, Nancy Adler's students this morning, of entering the discourse. That is their objective. They want to enter the discourse, and once they enter the discourse, they change the nature of the discourse. 
Moreover, deniers rely on a modus operandi that can easily camouflage their true intentions. They present themselves as neutral investigators whose only objective is to revise, to correct mistakes in history. Because of their skills at hiding their actual objectives, many lay people find it hard to identify their arguments as Holocaust denial and ipso facto false, and I'll develop that point in a moment. The third reason why I think deniers are worthy of our attention is because they have become particularly adept at the use of social media. It has given them a new lease on life and allowed them to spread seemingly rational arguments about the Holocaust to a vast audience. Now, at the same time that I'm here to talk about denial and to and accept an award, a very distinguished award on, for my work on denial, I also want to add something else before I jump into the topic. Um, my goal when I talk about denial is not to arouse fear and foreboding. Um, I sometimes think that ignorance of the Holocaust is more of a danger than Holocaust denial itself. However, um, I would like my observations about denials, particularly some of the resurgence we've seen of denial in recent years, to be heard not as a cry of alarm or impending assault, but rather as a call for sustained and serious caution and, attempt and attention. We heard earlier about the uh, way I define and delineate ba the basic premises of denial. There was no genocide. There was no campaign against the Jews. There was no singling out of the Jews for particular persecution. If, deniers say, if some Jews were killed, it was either because they deserved it or because they were spies, criminals, whatever, or because of naturally war-related privations. People always suffer in war and Jews amongst them. They make a particular point of denying the existence of gas chambers, even though, and gas buses, even though we know that a good proportion of those who were murdered as part of the final solution, as part of the Shoah, were killed by bullets. But they focus on gas chambers because gas chambers have become emblematic of the horrors of the Holocaust. I would say, and I'll deal again with her in a moment, but if there are two emblematic symbols of the Holocaust worldwide, they are gas chambers and the story of Anna Frank. Uh, gas chambers as an inexplicable uh, piece of engineered equipment designed with one purpose in mind, to murder, and to murder as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, bullets, which as I pointed out, uh, over well over a million uh, Jews were shot, were used by, were killed by bullets on the Eastern Front. Um, but guns can also be used to produce food to protect. Gas chambers had one purpose and one purpose in mind, and those were to kill. And finally, the Jews made this up in order to get a state, to, to have the world feel guilty, and therefore to give them a state, and to get money. I, again, I will uh, address that in a, uh, in a little bit in this talk. Um, now, of course, the, the irony here is that the Holocaust has a very dubious distinction of being the best documented genocide in history. Uh, there are other genocides very well documented. We talked earlier today with the students about the Armenian genocide, uh, the Rwandan genocide. There are other genocides that are documented, but because of the length of the persecution and because of the nature of uh, German um, fastidiousness, I don't know what word you want to use, there are uh, a singular uh, number of documents attesting to this uh, genocide. So how then do deniers explain away this evidence? 
in, and they must face indisputable evidence. So they offer non-sinister explanations. I'll just address a few of them. Uh, many of these came up, much of what I'm going to, the evidence I'm going to use and the instances I'm going to talk about were addressed in my trial. Uh, and uh, if you are uh, interested, the, all the transcripts are available online on a website called HDOT, Holocaust Denial on Trial. Dot org, O-R-G, and you can read all these, uh, this addressed and addressed in depth, both in the expert reports um, and in the transcripts of the 10-week court battle. But let me give you some examples of how they try to explain away uh, these facts with non-sinister explanations. Let's take the gas chambers at Auschwitz-Birkenau. They will tell you that they were, in fact, air raid shelters. This claim, of course, makes no sense. Those of you who have visited Auschwitz I or Birkenau, certainly the case in Birkenau, you know that the gas chambers are at the far end of the camp and the building in which the SS lived is at the very front of the camp, so it would have meant, uh, the, uh, in, in the case of an air raid, uh, the SS, uh, members of the SS suiting up and running almost a kilometer to uh, gas chambers, uh, which was not very uh, practical. Um, in, in they also argue and they could have only, and then they will tell you that, oh, they were gas chambers for the inmates of, they were uh, air raid shelters for the inmates of the camp, but of course they would have only held a fraction of the number of inmates at the camp. Or the, ca the cans of Zeklone Bay. Here they do something um, very crafty. Uh, they say, oh, those were used for fumigation purposes only and not for genocidal purposes. Why do I call this crafty? Because they take a fact that Zyklon Bay was used for fumigation. It was designed uh, by uh, Degesh, the company, uh, for fumigation purposes uh, and used in the camp to fumigate against uh, lice and other things. But that did, does not preclude it from being used for other purposes, in this case, the poisoning of people. As Professor, Rob, as one of your landslide, Professor Robert Jan van Pelt pointed out in his testimony at the trial, if you track the um, orders for Zyklon Bay against the number of people being deported to the camp and the rate of killings, they all work in the same trajectory. So as the, the killings rose in intensity in 1943, the orders for Zyklon Bay uh, rose equally in intensity as the killings uh, were completed. Most, most Jews were killed by mid-44 before they uh, began to murder Hungarian Jews. The orders go down. You can follow it almost exactly. Um, they, another argument that deniers will make, that terms such as Oschoten, uh, which, which means to up root in its most benign uh, meaning, but of course was used by the um, Third Reich as to destroy, to exterminate, are really benign and mean uprooting a community, not physically destroying it. In his testimony at the trial at Irving versus Penguin and, and Deborah Lipstadt, Christopher Browning discussed this extensively. He demonstrated how the, for the court how Jews in Vitebsk are cited in one German document as being given special treatment. Another German document, speaking of the same event, the same place, later states quite boldly that the 4,900 Jews of Vitebsk had been shot. He, points, he pointed out for the court how these words were used interchangeably and mixed with execution, shooting, liquidation, extermination. So you find uh, uprooting, liquidation, extermination, shooting being used in a series of documents interchangeably. The 1941-42 Einsatzgruppen reports document the precise number of Jews divided into men, women, children shot in the Eastern territories. Now, deniers will tell you, as David Irving argued in court, that these Jews who are listed as having been murdered during these operations were killed because they were partisans, criminals, spies, or subversives, not because they were Jews. And so, as Irving told the court, Germany was therefore justified in killing them. But 
he could not explain how the Jaeger report, one of these Einsatzgruppen reports, provided precise dates and places where Jews were being murdered, dividing categories, Jews, Jewesses, Jewish children, criminals, spies, subversive. So if they were criminals and spies and subversives, you wouldn't be killing them, and of course, why would you be killing children? There are many other tactics, but I just want to give those as emblematic. But they have other tactics as well. One of the most often cited tactics, those of you who saw the movie Denial, which I understand will again be shown here in um, Amsterdam in this coming month, um, know that there's an opening scene in which David Irving shows up at a lecture I'm giving at a college, Atlanta College, and starts waving around $1,000 to anyone who can get, show him the one document that proves Hitler ordered uh, the uh, destruction of the Jews. And deniers have long made this argument, they made it even before David Irving became active in the effort, uh, but he of course is one of those who has expanded on it. Show us that one document. Show us that one document which says, I, Adolf Hitler, hereby order the killing of the Jews. Now there are a variety of ways in which historians address the illogical and ahistorical nature of this argument. This is a document which virtually all historians, as many of you know, in, rel in all the relevant fields uh, relating to World War II, agree probably does not exist. In all likelihood, Hitler did not want to affix his signature to such an order, especially after the German public's negative reaction to the T4 program, the killing of the so-called handicapped and people with uh, various diseases, basically those the Nazis considered to be unworthy of life. Furthermore, as historian Peter Longerich noted in the report he prepared for the court, for my trial, while Hitler avoided giving a clear written order to annihilate Jewish civilians and, off, and also avoided publicly speaking about the killings, there is abundant evidence that he was deeply involved in the anti-Jewish policy before the war and during the war, especially when it reached a murderous stage. This was not something that could have been done without his direct uh, approval and involvement. His various oral and written comments on the topic of the quote-unquote Jewish question reveal, in Longerish words, his essential commitment to radicalize persecution to the extreme. Additionally, in the letters and speeches of Heinrich Himmler, one finds a number of references to the mass killing of the Jews as an effort he had to fulfill, quote, on behalf of the highest authority in the Third Reich, Hitler, end quote. Um, there is, of course, much else of, of evidence to this, but again, we have, uh, we, while we don't have the order, we have all these other references. But you don't really have to be familiar with the historical data to recognize that reputable historians, and there are many here today, rarely, if ever, will base their conclusions about an event on one document alone particularly when that event is of this magnitude and when a cache of evidence from perpetrators, bystanders, and survivors attests to the event's reality. In other words, you don't take the one doc, you don't have the one document, therefore negates uh, all the other uh, mass of evidence that you have. Uh, deniers also ignore the fact, willfully ignore the fact, or try to camouflage the fact, that given the Third Reich's intent on maintaining secrecy regarding the final solution, there is really no incompatibility between the actuality of, European, of the genocide of European Jewry and the absence of any written order from Hitler calling for that destruction. This was something, as many historians, beginning with Raoul Hilberg and many others, have documented the euphemisms which were used to uh, camouflage what was going on. But every once in a while, there was a slip. And in fact, on in my trial, we uh, brought in one order which showed where one uh, German uh, official uh, in, in, uh, at Auschwitz-Birkenau had talked about uh, gas chambers and it had, whoever had received that 
document, circled it, and with an exclamation point in red, in other words, don't use this term again. But finally, there's of course a logical fallacy in this contention by deniers, and it probably is the best argument of all. Deniers argue that Jews, of course, if there's evidence that they can't deny, they say this was made up by Jews, this document was fabricated by Jews, Jews fabricated evidence. Well, if that's the case, why then did the Jews not simply forge this one document and make sure it was planted in a place where it would be discovered as proof of the existence of a killing program? Doing so would have, provide, would have deprived deniers of their pivotal argument. So you don't have to know any of the history to f see the illogic there. Um, there is another tactics that, tactic that uh, deniers will use. They will argue that um, the Germans were so efficient and so well organized and so purposeful about everything that they did, particularly during the Third Reich, that they never would have allowed any witnesses to remain alive. That they would just never have allowed this to happen, that there should be witnesses to what happened, people, a Sunday commando, people who worked in the gas chambers, people who saw this happening in the various camps, that this is just antithetical to everything we know about Germans in general and the Third Reich in particular. That if they set their mind to something, they would never have let the, uh, and set their mind to doing this and wanted to keep it a secret, they would never have allowed witnesses to survive. Now, of course, sometimes I will pose this argument made by deniers to my class um, if I'm giving a seminar in denial, and early in the class, before we've actually jumped into looking at the material, and I'll ask my students to find the fallacy in there. And sometimes it takes one or two answers, but it doesn't take very long for a student to say, well, if according to deniers, the Germans were so efficient about everything they wanted to accomplish, and were, were, were so successful at all they wanted to accomplish, how come they didn't win the war? In other words, this whole supposition this is, this is based on a fallacy. So one can uh, answer deniers with documents, with historical documents, as with the case in, so, uh, done by the magnificent historical experts in my trial, but one can often uh, deconstruct their uh, activities using um, a plain old logic, which comes in very handy. The other thing deniers will do would be to engage in what I call immoral equivalencies. Not moral equivalencies, but immoral equivalencies. Um, they will argue that the myth of the Holocaust is a means of camouflaging allied wrongs. Deniers argue that not only did the Third Reich not commit this genocide, but the Allies were actually guilty of crimes of the same, if not severe, more severe magnitude than those the Germans are accused of committing. For example, deniers equate the Third Reich's concentration camps, which of course cannot be denied, they were known, they were publicized, et cetera, with the camps Americans had for, well, some people say we, America had camps for Japanese, but actually that's not correct. Uh, and it has particular relevance today with the uh, discussion going on in the United States and some of the sordid discussion about immigrants. Um, oh, well over half of the people in those camps were not Japanese, they were Americans who happened to be of Japanese descent. And that is, they were citizens, they were citizens of the United States. Um, but as wrong and immoral and illegal as those camps were, they do not compare in any manner, shape, or form with a Dachau, a Buchenwald, or a, even more so with a Treblinka, uh, Maidanek, or Auschwitz beer canal. Uh, a number of years ago, quite a few years ago, when I was first beginning in this uh, topic, I had the rather dubious pleasure of spending a day interviewing French Holocaust denier Robert Faurissant, who has made his home in Vichy. Um, uh, for some, one of the movement's elders began by saying to me, war is p terrible. People do awful things in war. All sides are guilty. 
He then proceeded to spend the next few arguing, hours arguing that yes, the Nazis had, done, had committed some wrongs, but ho so had the Allies, that these were equal wrongs on both sides. Uh, by the way, since I know there are a number of people here who study comparative genocides and other genocides, this is something we hear today about the Rwandan genocide, that, oh yes, uh, Tutsis were killed, but so were Hutus killed. It was really more of a civil war. Uh, you know, let's all sing Kumbaya and go on from there, um, which of course is a distortion of what happened. Um, going further in immoral equivalencies, deniers of invert perpetrators and victims, as we heard earlier this afternoon. The allies, they will argue, who were the pawns of the Jews, were, they again argue, worse than the Germans. Germans may, deniers concede, have allowed 100,000 people to die, they quite clearly use the term die, at Auschwitz-Birkenau over four years. But the Allies killed many more than that in the bombing of German cities in one night. So in other words, they did wrong, we did wrong, everybody did wrong. Uh, David Irving once told an audience of his followers, and I quote, ladies and gentlemen, 50,000 people were killed in Auschwitz from 1942 to 1944, a completely made up number, but that doesn't matter to him. That is a crime, as I said, 50,000 innocent people, but it's about as many people who as, it's about as many people who died in Auschwitz in those three years as we British killed in Hamburg in one night. So it's immoral equivalencies, but the Allies are even worse. And his comments were met with very uh, vibrant and enthusiastic applause. In 1991, in a television interview, he adopted a similar tactic. After contending that 100,000, some became 100,000 people, died at Auschwitz, he proceeded to argue. So even if we're generous, and say about a quarter of the 100,000 were killed by hanging or shooting, 25,000 is a crime, that's true. 25,000 people executed by one means or another, but we, the Allies, killed that many people, burning them alive in one night, not in three years, in a city like Fortsheim. We killed many, five times that number in Dresden in one night. Now, uh, David Irving has built much of his career on the bombing of uh, Dresden. If you, what we, we showed for the court, Richard Evans did this in a very, very um, comprehensive fashion. If you look at the different editions of his book about the bombing of Dresden, you can see the first estimate is 25,000, and then it goes up to 35,000, and I believe it was in the Italian, the Corgi edition uh, of the book, it's, it reaches is a quarter of a million. Um, uh, the uh, historian of Dresden, both the officials of Dresden at the time of the bombing in February 45, um, and subsequent historical investigations, quite recently, the, about, I would say, five, six years ago, the city of Dresden, so uh, anxious, upset, disturbed by the fact that it, it, the numbers who had killed had become part of the um, I use this term, the football of the deniers debate, being numbers being thrown around wild, wildly, uh, did a very extensive research and came up with a number of, I believe, 18,000. Now, 18,000 killed is in, in, in a bombing um, is not a small number, and I'm not denigrating that at all, but it's not a quarter of a million or 150,000, et cetera. But there is this uh, plane with uh, the numbers. The other thing deniers will often do is use even-handed language. They will use, choose language which in and of itself reforce, reinforces their claims. For example, deniers will use the word, as I mentioned earlier, died rather than murdered at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Consider Irving's comments in a television documentary, uh, again from 1991, quote, look at Auschwitz. 100,000 people died in Auschwitz. Most of them died of epidemics, as we now know. Died instead of murdered. So these are all both subtle and some not so subtle uh, claims uh, that uh, deniers will engage in. Now, I'm, I'm speaking to a Dutch 
audience, so I'm in many ways bringing Coles to, to borrow from Shakespeare, Coles to Newcastle when I talk about the diary of Anne Frank. Uh, but deniers spend a great deal of energy trying to deny the validity of uh, uh, Anna Frank's uh, diary. They will argue it's a bogus document written in ballpoint pen and therefore written after the war. Um, all their arguments have been extensively and conclusively uh, demonstrated to be false by the Netherlands State Institute for War Documentation and published in the Diary of Anne Frank, the critical edition, one of whose editors, David Barnow, is with us uh, this, this afternoon. The question remains, why do they place such emphasis on the diary? Well, one of the answers I already alluded to, it's that the gas chambers and the story of Anna Frank become emblematic symbols of the Holocaust. These purpose-built killing machines, the, by the way, the um, patents, not so much not for the uh, gas chambers, but for the ovens that were uh, built by the company Topf and Son. Um, they had special ovens. Again, if you've been to Auschwitz, to Auschwitz I, you may have seen the remaining ones, which were what were called, what engineers called multi-muffle ovens. The muffle is the hole in which you, or the entry place where you, where you put the body to be cremated. In regular commercial um, cremation places, uh, you just burn one body at the time. If you've brought your uh, parent to be cremated, you want those ashes and not the ashes of someone else. But uh, for Auschwitz-Birkenau um, and for some of the other camps, um, Tuff and Son designed a multi-muffle oven in which there were three or four openings and all the ashes would fall into the same place. It's, they designed that because it was more uh, efficient, more fuel efficient, using less coke, less coal, um, and less energy. And then as um, some of the Sunder commandos, the Jews who were forced to work in the uh, gas chambers, and then every six months they would be murdered because they had seen too much, um, testified that they figured out very quickly that if they uh, burnt, and this is from the testimony given at the, to the Polish commit, Commission of Inquiry, which was conducted immediately after the war, um, if they uh, burnt what they called emaciated bodies with unemaciated bodies, they had to use less coal because the fat from the unemaciated bodies uh, reinforced, the, reinforced the fire, and the supposition of historians, and by the way, the, as I say, the, the plans for these multi-muffle ovens are available in the Berlin Patent Office, uh, dated 1942. You can also look at Robert Jan von Pelt's work and his report to the court um, for, for my trial, in which he discusses them as well. So uh, they want to create doubts about the gas chambers. And similarly, because the, going back to the diary of Anne Frank, because Anna Frank's diary is uh, the entry point for so many people in the world into the history of the Holocaust, um, I think until, and I don't say this shockingly, but until Harry Potter, it was the second most translated work. I'm looking at, you'll, you'll, you'll tell me if I'm right or wrong. It was the second most tra translated work in the world, the first being the Bible. Um, so if, if we can say to someone who I read Di Diary, oh, Diary of Anne Frank, it's, it's, it's false, it's phony, it's written in green ballpoint pen, it's on paper that wasn't produced during the war, it's her handwriting changes, all these questions were answered uh, by the experts in the critical edition, which I mentioned um, earlier. So that uh, what, what deniers often say about Diary of Anne Frank, uh, falsus in unum, fal uh, in, uh, falsus in omnibus. If it, we can pull out one thing, we can pull out, we can destroy um, everything. Now, at the outset of this presentation, I noted that though I initially laughed when I learned of such a thing as Holocaust denial, I changed my opinion after studying deniers. That was not due to the arguments they make. I knew they were false. N nor did I change my opinion because I feared they were making tremendous inroads on public opinion and were convincing broad numbers of people that the Holocaust it was a myth. It was their tactics 
that convinced me that they were a serious threat. And again, I believe that, as I told some students, this, uh, uh, Professor Adler students this morning, um, I believe this has quite contemporary uh, relevance. Um, the deniers were around since the very end of World War II. Um, in fact, you mentioned the Eichmann trial. We know that when Adolf Eichmann was in Argentina in Buenos Aires and he was uh, meeting with a group of uh, Germans, many of whom had not just uh, some of whom had fled after the war, but many of whom were German expats who had been living there uh, during the war, but who were loyal uh, supporters of the Third Reich. And this is after the war, this is in the 50s. Um, and he would meet and tell them about what had happened. They would, they would discount what he said. He said, no, this, this couldn't be true, and they were actively involved in spreading denial um, arguments. Um, but for the most part, uh, deniers who were around in, in France and other places in the late 40s, in the 50s, even into the early, into the 60s, um, were generally associated with what we call neo-Nazi groups. Uh, groups that open, openly adulated Adolf Hitler, openly revered the Third Reich, who sometimes dressed in their private meetings in uh, SS-like uniforms, had flags which maybe did not have a uh, swastika on it, but had something quite similar to a swastika, filmed themselves giving the Sig Heil salute, etc. They were the kinds of people with whom you didn't want to be associated. The, the external accoutrements that they, uh, and, and the, the, the vibrations they projected, to use a more contemporary term, were the kind of things that were, for most people, off-putting. It would be a similar thing in my country if it was talking about racism. If once you saw someone walking in the street or you came into a meeting and the person was wearing a flowing white gown and a white pointed uh, headgear with a, a sort of mask on their face, clearly the, the dress of the Ku Klux Klan, this would be something to say, I don't want to be associated with those kinds of uh, people. But in the 70s, they be, their tactics began to evolve. This is exactly at the time that Yehuda Bauer first told me about them. Um, they, the, they evolved in the sense that the, any external signs of uh, adulation of the Third Reich, of adulation of Adolf Hitler, were gone. If they had, they, they had an institute which they created in California called the Institute for Historical Review. They had some similar ones here in Europe. Here in Europe, it was a little harder for them because of the laws against Holocaust denial. Uh, they insisted on being called revisionists and not deniers because they, they argued their objective was to revise mistakes in history. We are not anti-Semites, we are not lovers of the Nazis, we are only interested in the truth and we want to revise mistakes in history. Of course, once you looked at what they were writing, what they were publishing, it became clear what they were really doing, but this was their external um, argument. They published a journal called the Journal for Historical Review. And in fact, there, which if you first picked it up and just flipped through it, you said, oh, here's a journal for historical review, a journal which addresses, it, it says in the, in the, in the, in the uh, opening page, mistakes in history. Of course, when you look at the table of contents, they all have to do with the Holocaust. Um, but the journal in first glance looked like a serious academic journal. And there was an instance of a student, this is the late 80s, when I was just beginning to, I was just finishing up writing my book, came to my attention, of a student who was graduating from Yale University, undergraduate history major, very fine history department. And he had written his senior thesis on some aspect of the aerial warfare of World War II on the Luftwaffe. And his professor said to him, this is a good paper. You should think about trying to have it published. 
So an, this energetic and uh, a student took himself off to the Yale Library, and where before journals were only on, people didn't, don't know, journals used to be, the younger people, they used to be published. You could pick them up and actually hold them and flip through them. Um, he took himself off to the section of the library, the journals, uh, journals on history, and began to look for journals that he thought might be appropriate for public, uh, publishing his work. And he found the Journal for Historical Review, and he flipped through it, looks, oh, so much about World War II, this would be a good place. So he took a copy, sent them a letter, would you be interested in publishing, and sent it off, and they responded immediately, published it in their next issue, and sent him a check for $300. He was, of course, horrified when ex post facto he learned that this was the journal of Holocaust deniers and he donated the money to the uh, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which was then being built, came to meet with the people there, and that's how the story uh, came to my attention. And what I said is, um, had he been a bit more experienced in... Um, issues of publication, academic publications, historical journals, there were three things that should have tipped him off. A, that they accepted it right away. B, that they published it right away. And C, that they sent him a check. You know, uh, I've never received a check from any journal, you know, so. Um, but, um, Again, it's that what they are essentially, to use a, a, a colloquium, uh, uh, they are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. And, clothing. and of course, today we have much of that in terms of racism, in terms of prejudice. Uh, dress it up, make it sound like academic inquiry. Um, I'm just saying, the, the, I'm just saying that, you know, are women really as good in computer science? I'm just saying that, you know, and I'm not saying that these uh, attitudes are the equivalent of attitudes which justify a genocide, but it's that you take this hateful, um, uh, prejud prejudicial ideas and you dress them up so that they look like rational discourse. And then it enters, and that again is the objective, as I said earlier in this presentation, that is the objective of deniers, to be part of the conversation. So that they will also argue, why can't we be heard in the academic discourse? You have all sorts of ideas being um, studied, being analyzed. Why not our ideas? Why not our opinions? Uh, which, of course, uh, brings me to the next point where many people will talk about you can have your own opinions, you can have your own facts, a, a saying uh, attributed to the uh, late senator from uh, the state of New York, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Harvard professor, as well, that's second being state, uh, senator from the state. There are fewer senators than there are Harvard professors. Um, but uh, that you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. Um, but I look at it differently, and this is something that came out of my work on deniers. There are facts, there are opinions, and then there are lies. If someone were to tell you it's my opinion that the earth is flat, you would not invite him to your scientific faculty to give a talk you know, in the geology or geography or earth sciences department. You might say, why would anybody in their right mind still believe the earth is flat? And you might decide the person is not in their right mind. Um, but that's a lie. So I think this idea that all opinions are worthy of consideration is just wrong. And so when I began to say that early on in my work on denial, many people uh, thought I was a troglodyte, thought I was you know, unenlightened, everything should be debated and discussed. But I think there's certain things which are proven to be wrong um, and not open to discussion. And of course, this extends well beyond Holocaust denial or even gen other gen denial of other genocides. Now, how do we counter deniers claims? I've, I've talked a little bit about that. Um, I talked about the basic logic uh, one can use to answer them. Um, one can ask the questions, as I have done uh, in, in other presentations, for deniers to be cor correct in their contention that the Holocaust was a myth, who has to be wrong? Well, the victim, certainly, you say, this is my story, this is what happened to me. 
But it's not only the victims who must be wrong in order for the deniers to be right. The bystanders, uh, including the Poles who lived in the villages near the camps, who watched as day, day after day as the trains went in full of people and came out empty. Uh, these were the people, if you're familiar with Claude Lanzmann's epic documentary, Shoah, he interviewed many of them and they said, of course we knew what was going on. Uh, or the, uh, the Polish engineer who, who drove some of the trains who becomes sort of the logo uh, for uh, the movie. But there were others as well. There were Poles such as Jan Karski, who after sneaking into both a ghetto and an uh, extermination camp, annihilation camp, brought his eyewitness reports to both London and Washington, where they were dismissed as it couldn't, this can't be true. There were industrialists such as the German, uh, the German Eduard Schulte, the head of a mining company that had a branch near Auschwitz-Birkenau and who learned from SS officers there what was taking place in the camp. They, of course, told it to him quite proudly and he was horrified. He gave the information on the gassing to the representative of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, Gerhard Riegner, um, and who, again, passed it on uh, to uh, the United States and to England. Another uh, bystander was the renegade SS officer, Kurt Gerstein, who witnessed a gassing in Belzec and then told a Swedish diplomat about it. But these were, of course, not the only eyewitnesses. Some of the eyewitnesses on the German front were the German Einsatz members of the, the, the German members of the Einsatzgruppen and, and their allies, uh, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Estonians, etc., who murdered over one million Jews. They gave precise and detailed information about their genocide, and they've been many have been doing so in recent years. Uh, to Father Patrick Dubois, some of you may be familiar with his work in documenting these shootings. Who else would have to be wrong? Well, the thousands of historians, North American, European, Israeli, South American, Australian, Asian, among others, the thousands of Europeans who work on this topic, they either would have all had to have been duped, tricked, or would have to be part of this very conspiracy itself. It beggars the imagination to think that these historians and other scholars have all been fooled by this charade. And yet, finally, there is the best source of all. One of the source that would have to be wrong for deniers to be right. And I speak, of course, of the German perpetrators, particularly the German perpetrators. Um, from a deductive or forensic perspective, this last source may be the most critically important. In a court, an admission of guilt is more, always the, the more powerful than an accusation. Um, their te testimony, um, not only have the perpetrators not denied the killings, but they have affirmed that they happened. So how, how can deniers explain that in not one war crimes trial that since the end of World War II has a perpetrator of any nationality denied that these events occurred? They may have said, I was forced to kill, I had no choice, as Eichmann did in Jerusalem, as some of the other defendants did at the Auschwitz process, the Auschwitz-Frankfurt trial in 1963, um, but they have never said it didn't happen. Deniers attempt to shed doubt on these German admissions of guilt by arguing that these perpetrators were in allied hands. They were prisoners of war when they admitted to the crime of genocide. According to the deniers, the Allies, acting at the behest of the Jews, forced the German POWs to make these admissions. But again, here, let's use logic. Precisely what could the Allies have threatened them with that was worse than the punishment they would have received as a result of their admissions of guilt? You know, you might say to someone, you better tell the court that you murdered those people, because if you don't, I will kill you. But if I tell the court that I murdered those people, the court will kill me. In other words, it's, it's again, an illogic uh, claim. Um, there was nothing the captors could have done to them once they made those claims. And why, if Germany was innocent of this massive crime, did it accept the financial and moral burden after the war? 
Now, deniers have an answer for that. They contend that the Jews were so successful in spreading the myth of the Holocaust and implanting evidence that Germany had no choice but to expect, accept the burden of guilt, despite being innocent, in order to be uh, readmitted to the family of uh, so-called civilized nations. Here, too, there's a logical fallacy in the deniers' claims. German leaders, Konrad Adenauer and many of those around him, some of whom were actually part of this effort, but those who were not, surely must have recognized that admitting responsibility for an unprecedented genocide, genocidal attempt to wipe out an entire people from one end of a continent to the other and beyond would impose upon their country a hideous legacy. They would be admitting, falsely according to deniers, to having committed an unprecedented criminal act. And that's precisely what happened. In order to, uh, uh, in order to be accepted into this so-called family of nations, the, German ex the Germans accepted responsibility for a horrific and unprecedented, unprecedented crime one that the ar uh, deniers argue they did not do. And the claim of it, problem with it, today, even after seven decades, is Germany bears the burden of this genocide. And it has a direct role in its political positions and its political um, decisions. One can uh, argue that Angela Merkel's decision about admitting refugees was clearly made with the shadow of this genocide in, if not in her, I'm, I'm sure in her frontal lobe, but certainly uh, sitting on her shoulder. Um, deniers will, another claim that deniers will make is that the myriad of documents, as I mentioned earlier about the one document, um, that the, if they were forged, that the Jews could have forged, but even speaking generally about the documents that were found, forging and planting these documents would have been exceptionally difficult, if not impossible. Official German documents from that period, if you've ever seen these documents and they're online, they're easy to see, bear identification numbers, file designations, and a series of other extensive markings. You, if you understand the documents, you can see what office originated them, uh, who, to whom they went, to which it was sent, who read it, et cetera, et cetera. A forged document would have had to bear a number that corresponded to those that preceded it and those that followed it. You couldn't just type up a document and put it in the file and let it uh, sit there. Moreover, it would have had to have been in the same font, the same typeface, and have the same strength typewriter ribbon. Now, the younger people here, someone explained to them what a typewriter ribbon is. We can do that later. Um, the, the printer cartridge would have had to be at the same strength to talk in a contemporary parlance. Um, and then copies of the same document would have had to have been planted in the originating file. It's not an easy thing to do. So to claim that these documents were just forged and put out on the market is, of course, a ludicrous uh, kind, to, um, a kind of claim to make. The list of illogical arguments goes on. Deniers contend that the Third Reich, a regime they consider to be the epitome of efficiency, as I said earlier, would not have let survivors um, survive. But of course, we, we pointed out how that, um, uh, the fallacy in that argument. So what about legal strategies? Let me turn to my lawsuit. Um, in defending the libel charges brought against me by David Irving, my legal team had the option of two different forensic strategies. Here, too, we had to choose the most efficacious way of countering deniers' spurious arguments. Now, we, wanted, we had two choices, actually two different ways to, to approach it. One choice would have been to take the myriad of documents, of material evidence, uh, testimony, et cetera, and place it, proving that the Holocaust happened, and place it before the court. We could have brought survivors to have testified. Uh, it, there were very few survivors alive in 2000 who could have testified to the killing, but many who were close enough, and there were still some Sonderkommandos alive at that time who might have been able uh, to, um, uh, to testify. But the historical documentation we would have presented to the court would have been posed against David Irving's uh, and other deniers' lies and distortion. 
We didn't doubt that we could have proved our documents to be true. We, couldn't have, we didn't doubt that we could have proved that our, the version of history we were presenting to the court was indeed um, the correct one. However, had we used that strategy, we would have turned the courtroom into a venue for a debate about the existence of the Holocaust. And this, for those of you who are familiar with these Holocaust denial issues, is exactly what happened in Canada. We have Canadian representative in Canada in the trial of Ernst Zundel in the late 1980s, a, a German expat, a Holocaust denier, who was on trial for having violated German hate crimes, and his trial, and there was a hung jury, so there were actually two trials, um, it turned into a debate over the evidence of the Holocaust, and it was quite disturbing, you know, whether there were swimming pools in Auschwitz or things like that. Uh, Zundel says there were swimming pools. Holocaust historian says they weren't. They were really uh, places with, with water for in case of fire. But you had the uh, uh, observers had to weigh whose claim they thought was more uh, correct, had more historical validity. I told my lawyers from the outset, and they agreed, that while there's much to debate about the Holocaust, um, you know, whose idea was it? Did it come from below and go up to Hitler? Did it come from on top and go down? Um, there are many things who were uh, bystanders. What was the role of the uh, Dutch people? Not, Anne Frank notwithstanding. Many things which I know are contemporary debates, and I've heard about them just in the few days that I've been here. Um, the Holocaust itself should, while it should be a matter of extensive research, that research, and that research should be debated among scholars, there is no Holocaust history orthodoxy. Uh, about a, two dec a decade and a half ago, uh, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen came up with an idea about, uh, in which he presented in his book, um, Hitler's Willing Executioners, and it was a way to answer Christopher Browning's claim that he made in ordinary people. Were these ordinary uh, men or ordinary men, not ordinary people, ordinary men, or were they ordinary Germans? Uh, and a fierce de debate existed amongst uh, historians, but not about the existence of the Holocaust itself. Um, unwilling to allow the court to become a venue for such a debate, even if I had won, I would have considered it a false victory uh, to have won with putting, making this even-handed debate between lies and historical evidence. Since the United Kingdom legal system placed the burden of proof on me as the defendant, we had to prove that what I said about David Irving was true that he was a denier, a falsifier of history, and an anti-Semite. And how did we do this? We did not take that first um, uh, path, that first possible way of approaching it. What we did instead was prove, we followed his footnotes back to the sources, and we proved that what he said was not true. In other words, we did not prove what happened we proved that what he claimed to be the case was not the truth. So at one point in a very, if you just read it now in the transcripts, it can be a little bit jarring, but at one point when my solicitor, um, my uh, barrister rather, my QC, um, was uh, questioning Mr. Irving on the stand about the number of deaths and murders at Auschwitz where, and where Irving had claimed there at the one point it was 50,000, 100,000, another time he said 64,000. Um, my barrister said to him, Mr. Irving, I am not interested in how many people were murdered at Auschwitz. He, but then he went on to say, I am interested in proving to this court that when you say it was, quote unquote, only 64,000, you don't have the evidence to prove it. And that's what we did over and over again. He would make a claim, and we would follow to the sources, and we would find that the evidence he, he, he said he had for this simply didn't prove his argument. Um, we did it with Kristallnacht, we did it with the murder of Hungarian Jews, we did it with the existence of the camps, we did it over and over again. We also did it with his contacts with uh, uh, extremists, racists, neo-Nazis, etc. At one point, um, we asked him in our interrogatories, our pre-trial questions, uh, did you ever meet and interact with David Duke? 
Uh, David Duke, the former head of the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, still a very active extremist neo-Nazi uh, far-right person. And he said no. And then we went to his diaries and found in his diaries, uh, went to Key West, Florida, uh, had a wonderful encounter, exactly how he described the encounter, with a young man from New Orleans who came down here. His name is David Duke. I went over and helped him edit his book. Um, so were you lying then or are you lying now? So in other words, again, not proving what happened, but proving that his claims, his arguments have no validity, which in the end turned out to be far more powerful and some of what I have been showing you uh, uh, this, this evening. Um, in sum, uh, uh, Richard Evans uh, summarized it for the court when he said, the overall purpose of these expert reports is not to show what had actually happened. The purpose was to put before the court evidence which any fair-minded, objective commentator would have to take into account when writing about these issues. The evidence the evidence, in turn, provided the basis for the defense's argument that Irving, Irving was neither objective nor fair-minded in his treatment of the issue. We won, as you all know. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, this is a spoiler alert. Uh, we, we won a decisive victory. The judge uh, d decided, it appears to me, in that to be incontrovertible that Irving qualifies at a Holocaust as a Holocaust denier. His account of history flies in the face of the available evidence. It is perverse, egregious. Um, these were not inadvertent mistakes on his part, but they followed a uh, pattern. Um, it, we demonstrated to the court also, as the court decided, that he was a racist, a Nazi, uh, I'm sorry, a neo-Nazi, uh, an anti-Semite, um, and that his denial of the Holocaust was not uh, ex nihilo, but was rooted in his bigoted and racist Weltanschauung. We, we were successful in doing, so successful in doing that that the judge wrote in his judgment, Irving holds views which are pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic. He is an active protagonist and supporter of extreme right-wing policies that would support the inference that he perverts the historical evidence to make it, to, to make it conform to his ideological uh, debate, uh, ideological belief, excuse me. Um, about uh, Irving's racism, the judge wrote, I have concluded that the allegation that Irving is a racist is also established. The way he talks about the AIDS epidemic, wiping out blacks, homosexuals, drug addicts, and others have, in my view, a distinctly racist uh, flavor. He is an Irving is an anti-Semite, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he is um, associated with neo-Nazis who are, and he is a, a, a neo-Nazi uh, polemicist. So the uh, trial also demonstrated, and this was exceptionally important to me, um, the link between denial and racism, uh, anti certainly between anti-Semitism, but denial and racism. You will find if you go to white supremacist uh, websites, I don't encourage you to do this, but were you to do this, you will find that they actively deny the Holocaust. They deny the Holocaust because they will argue, A, they are anti-Semitic, but they will also argue um, that uh, the Holocaust is used to discredit uh, the uh, Third Reich's argument of the superior of the Aryan being. Um, and that, uh, so the Holocaust is used to keep them from arguing of the supremacy and the superiority of the white person. So there, the racism fits right in there. My final th point that I want to address, or uh, penultimate point tonight, is Holocaust denial and anti-Semitism. In, in a way, it, it sort of, it shouldn't be necessary at this point, but I think it's important uh, because the, the, how have been deniers been able to gain any traction with this absurd uh, theory and these absurd um, arguments? In part, their ex one of their explanations as I mentioned at the very outset, is that the, the Jews have created this myth of the Holocaust in order to get a state, the state of Israel, and to get money from, to bilk, not, uh, from, to bilk uh, Germany uh, out of billions of uh, dollars, billions of uh, marks or euros, whatever term you want to use. Um, both these claims, getting a state and money, um, go right to the heart 
of the basic anti-Semitic stereotype, the basic anti-Semitic pr prejudicial argument. They, of course, have their roots in the story, the deicide story, as it has been interpreted and related by many uh, church fathers and uh, by, by many within the church over millennia. Uh, and to argue that uh, just as uh, the world was deprived, people, millennia of people were deprived of Jesus' divine goodness because the Jews insisted he be killed by the Romans. Of course, it was the Romans who killed him, but that's superfluous. That's not part of the um, argument. Um, why did they do that? In part because he um, insisted that the money changers be chased out of the temple. So just as Jews, and if you look at anti-Semitic charges, you find these elements, whether it's coming from uh, religious anti-Semitism, political anti-Semitism, from the right, from the left, it doesn't matter. There's certain elements, as in any prejudice. If you were talking about prejudice towards Muslims, if you're talking about prejudice towards uh, people, uh, black people, you find, certainly in my country, you find similar kinds of um, uh, prejudicial constants in African Americans, shiftless and lazy, not smart, welfare cheats, all code words for the prejudicial, of course not true, but I want to insist that, but uh, for the prejudicial sentiments towards uh, persecuted uh, peoples. So that um, their Weltanschauung, the deniers Weltanschauung, is, sh is shaped by this uh, prejudice. Um, before I conclude, though, and, and something which isn't in the written text, but I feel necessary to add it just briefly, um, is why this is particularly important today. Why is Holocaust denial, and my story of being sued, though it happened uh, 18 years ago, um, why does it have contemporary relevance more so than being an interesting um, attack on history? It's, well, certainly there's been more uh, denial of genocide. The Holocaust was, of course, not the first uh, genocide to be denied, um, in, in certainly in modern times. That was the Armenian genocide, which Turkey continues to deny. Um, but, but it's not just genocide denial. It's because these same tactics of dressing up hatred and dressing up prejudice in rational clothing, not only goes on today, but has achieved a new found growth, a new found renaissance um, in a way that is deeply disturbing. It's deeply disturbing to any rational-minded person, any person who believes in the truth, et cetera, but it's deeply disturbing to me personally and any of the other Americans, many of the other Americans, I assume, who are here because of what is going on in my country coming from the highest offices in the land. Uh, not just an attack, uh, a, it's not to say that uh, those with the most power, official power in, and, and great power in, our, in my country have created uh, these prejudices have created these hatreds, but they have whipped them up. Uh, it's just like the Third Reich, uh, Adolf Hitler, those around him, did not create anti-Semitism, but they knew how to play upon it. Um, and we are seeing that certainly in many countries uh, today. Uh, and we are seeing it in, certainly again in the United States, but not only in the United States, with the attack on democratic institutions, with the attacks on the courts. The courts cannot be trusted. The courts cannot be believed. Uh, with the attack in, in, in the United States on the Federal Bureau of Investigation, I'd be the last one to defend everything in the FBI's record, but to begin to uh, argue that it is corrupt it is that there is a deep state, that there is another secret cabal going on um, that is uh, taking control of the United States to create doubts in people's minds about the validity of democracy, about the validity of the democratic uh, discourse, about the value, certainly again in the United States, of immigration, immigrants to uh, our country as the child of two immigrants, one from Canada, but one from uh, Germany who came before the war came during Weimar, but still who, who found a home in, in the United States and contributed massively to the United States, children, grandchildren who are continuing uh, that contribution, seeing it all around me, seeing it, uh, there was a universal sort of acceptance for, for decades, for centuries in the United States of the value of the immigrants, certain immigrants, you know, you didn't like, but they 
uh, acclimated or whatever, but the, but the general feeling now that immigration is a negative term, all being presented in a way that sounds like rational discourse. The attacks on the media, the lying press, the fake news, um, all those are tactics which I have found in Holocaust denial. It is to um, entering the discourse slowly but surely that people who may not, if they understood what it really was, would probably reject it but don't because of the way it has been camouflaged. Uh, we live in dangerous times uh, because the, what I have been describing about Holocaust deniers we see in so many other um, context, uh, as I say, in the United States, but certainly not only in the United States, here in the European continent, you have it as well, and I don't have to belabor that point because you know it better than I. The task ahead of us is great to paraphrase a teaching of Ethics of the Elders, Perkei Avoda, a, a Jewish book of teachings from the um, first centuries. Uh, the, the day is short, the work is great, uh, the people are impatient, in that book it says the master God is impatient, but impatient that we fight this effort. This is not something we can sit back, denial of truth, uh, use of uh, the truth, bending of the truth to achieve political ends, particularly pre prejudicial political ends. Uh, this to my mind, and, and I, I'm, I, I don't like to speak hyperbolically, uh, this to my mind is in many respects a war, a war which good people, which people who value truth, uh, who value justice, um, cannot afford to sit by and let be lost. Thank you very much.